It is tremendously encouraging to see a full house again tonight. I, I want to concur how much I appreciate the fact that we have such a good number of visitors out tonight as we did last night, and pray that you have brought your Bibles and that you're ready to study God's Word and to see what He has to say about this particular subject. I want to express appreciation to those who have driven so far to be here and to be a part of uh, this gospel meeting. And again, I want to thank the elders here for the invitation. Uh, it has been so encouraging for me to be able to be working with the church here, to get to know each one of you, uh, to see your unfeigned faith in just such a short amount of time. I, I know that this week is going to go by far too quickly. You know, it wasn't just a few years ago that I probably uh, could count everyone that I knew from Indianapolis or from this uh, uh, area on one hand or even less than, and in a, really just a few short years and being able to come up and hold meetings here, uh, it, it's been incredible to have grown so close so quickly uh, to such a number of, of brethren here. And uh, Brad, I appreciate your prayer. Uh, he and his wife, I made their acquaintance in a meeting in Crawfordsville and I was just absolutely refreshed by the time that I was able to be with them and their work in the gospel. And I am thrilled about the work that they're doing. Um, I think I called it Bellevue. It's Belleville, right? <laughs> Getting some of these uh, towns' names down in my head, but uh, so good to see them uh, tonight. And uh, the elders here from Danville with their good wives, I appreciate them so much. I've grown so close uh, to Rodney and to Todd and appreciate uh, the work that's going on there, and just brethren throughout this area uh, to see Lanny again uh, after last night. It's been many years since I uh, was with them at, at Brownsburg, and uh, I say many years. It really wasn't that long ago. It was around the time that I moved to Kansas City, but I uh, just appreciate them so much as well. I want to uh, express, though, that uh, as happy as I am to see you all here, I, I want you to know that I'll be back in September at Danville, and so uh, make sure that you make plans to be supporting that meeting. And I want you to know, I won't be preaching the same lineup there. So you're not going to hear the same sermons over again. We'll, we'll have a new set uh, to be able to study. Uh, so we hope that you'll come out for that. I appreciate the scripture reading, Derek. We are looking there in Romans chapter 10. And where he tells us in verse 13 that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, there's not anything more important that we could be looking at than what it means to be saved or how by the grace of God and by the death of Jesus Christ we might be saved. But it is not simply by the grace of God. It is not simply by the death of Christ. If it were simply by that, everyone would be saved. But the Bible's message is there is good news. We can be saved, but it requires something of us. And there are a lot of ways that we could put that. Certainly, we must surrender all. There's no doubt that we must lay ourselves at the feet of the Christ and that we make ourselves his servants and, and become a part of that kingdom. But just how exactly is that accomplished? We hear a lot of different ideas about what we do in order to be saved. And I want to ask you this evening, as, as you open your Bible and begin to study with us, have you called on the name of the Lord Jesus? Obviously, if you haven't, you haven't been saved. But you might say, oh, yes, Brett, I absolutely have. That's wonderful. I'd like to hear more about that. Maybe after the sermon, we can talk about it. But I want to discuss some things that you might be able to relate to tonight. And all that I ask is that you give me your ear and that you give me an honest heart and a willingness to look at what the scriptures say. I'm not asking you to believe what I think. We're not going to talk about what I think. We're going to simply go to the scriptures we're going to let it be its own commentary. We're not, going to, we're not going to turn to the writings of men. We're going to hear what God has to say about it. Now, to begin with, though, I do want to introduce what I have commonly heard as an explanation of calling on the name of the Lord. Growing up in a little town in central Oklahoma, had lots of friends that, that worshipped in various denominations there. And what I most commonly heard was uh, something to the effect of what I received in tract form in the first year of my preaching. I was in the Texas Panhandle, and a, and a young man in the church there, he was in high school, someone had given him a tract, and, and he asked me to look at it. He said, Brett, I'd like you to take a look at this and, and go over it with me and, and help me to understand what this is saying. 
Well, I, I looked at it and it was, it was interesting. It was a very concise tract about calling on the name of the Lord that was being handed out by one of the local denominations. The tract was entitled, Do You Know For Sure That You're Going To Be With God In Heaven? I can't think of a better question to ask. And so it begins to answer that question. And it talks about the fact that we need to consider why would God even let us into heaven? It points out the fact that heaven or eternal life is a free gift. It is not earned. It is not deserved. And I would say amen. It points out that man is a sinner and cannot save himself. But because God is merciful, he wants to save us. But because God is just, there has to be a punishment for sin. And again, I'm with it all the way. It brings up Jesus Christ as a solution to this uh, position of being merciful and just. And that's Romans chapter 3. What did he do? He died for you on the cross. And then it talks about faith. And it even talks about saving faith. And, and the fact that, that uh, uh, we, we've got to uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved, Acts 16 and verse 31. And then as it gets to page 13 on this, on this little uh, fold-out track, it says, would you like to receive the gift of eternal life? And because this is such an important matter, let's clarify. It means, first of all, that you transfer your trust from what you've been doing to what Christ has done for you on the cross. It means next that you receive the resurrected living Christ into your life as Savior. Now, this is what we've commonly heard, or at least what I've commonly heard. You've got to accept Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior. Receive him into your life as your Savior. And they quote Revelation 3 in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock at the door, uh, and then they put in brackets at the door of your life. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. Now, I just want to stop there and just to clarify something. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20 is not written to alien sinners who haven't been saved. I don't know how familiar you are with the book of Revelation, but what I want you to realize is that chapter 3 is a series of letters that Jesus told John to deliver to the churches of Asia. So this was a letter to the church at Laodicea. What is the church? According to Acts chapter 2, the church is composed of the saved. He added to the church those who were being saved. So it was to the church at Laodicea, and I realized that they had for the most part, rejected him. They were blind and, and, and metaphorically naked and, the, and they, were, they were in sin, but they had already called on the name of the Lord. They had to have done that to be a part of the church. So that is not written to somebody that needs to obey the gospel in order to be saved as Derek read to us there in Romans 10, verse 13 and notice verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. These people had. They needed to repent. They needed to come back to the Lord but when this verse is quoted in regards to initial salvation, it's actually being taken out of context, just for the record. And then it goes on, and he says, it means further that you receive Jesus Christ into your life as Lord. Certainly, we've got to submit to him. I would agree with that. And it explains some of that. But then on verse 15, uh, uh, page 15, it says, uh, if this is what you really want, you can go to God in prayer right where you are. You can receive his gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ right now. And he quotes Romans 10 and verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. And then the tract says, if you want to receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, then call on him asking for this gift right now. Here's a suggested prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I'm a sinner and do not deserve eternal life, but I believe that you died and, uh, uh, and rose from the grave to purchase a place in heaven for me. Lord Jesus, come into my life, take control of my life, forgive my sins, and save me. I repent of my sins, and now place my trust in you for my salvation. I accept the free gift of eternal life. Then the tract says, if this prayer is a sincere desire of your heart, look at what Jesus promises to those who believe in him. John 6, 47, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Welcome to God's family. And then it speaks about how you'll receive this gift of eternal life forever, which is once saved, always saved. That's a topic for another study. But what I want you to see is that this is, I believe, the most popular view of calling on the name of the Lord. And that is to pray a prayer 
to receive Jesus into your life as your personal Savior and to pray this prayer based upon faith. And through and then praying that prayer, you're calling on the name of the Lord in order to have salvation. Now, that may be what you did. And if it is, again, all I ask is to give fair study to this subject. And I'll be willing to give you a fair hearing afterwards. I'll spend as much time as you want to and study about this. But I just want to ask the question, is that what is involved in calling on the name of the Lord? Well, I want to look at a few passages that are commonly used as proof texts for what is sometimes called the sinner's prayer, you know, praying to call on the name of the Lord. People often refer to that as the sinner's prayer. And what passages would we go to that actually teach praying to God in order to call on the name of the Lord? Well, the first passage that is normally uh, 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 cited, it wasn't cited in this track, but is in Luke chapter 18. So if you turn there with me, in Luke chapter 18, I want you to notice with me the context of verse 13. Now, we're not going to start in verse 13. I want you to start back in verse 9. In Luke chapter 18, and in verse 9, the scripture says there, and he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, someone would say, well, Brett, here's an example. Jesus said this man went down to his house justified, and what did he do? He prayed to God, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And so folks might say, well, here's the Bible example of praying the sinner's prayer. This is calling on the name of the Lord. Well, first of all, I want you to see that Jesus does not refer to this as calling on the name of the Lord. I'll say more about that in a minute. I do realize that there is a way to call on the name of the Lord where we cry out to the Lord. I do realize that. I do not believe that that's what is the way it's being used in Romans 10, 13, but I'll explain that in a minute. But this man certainly did pray to God, but is this an example of what an alien sinner, when I say alien, I know you're probably thinking about Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> alien is, a, is, is someone who is outside, okay? Is the idea of a foreigner, someone who's outside of Christ. And we're really, this evening, we're not talking about what a Christian needs to do to be forgiven of sin. We're talking about what a person who is not a Christian, a person who has never been a believer, what must they do in order to be saved, in order to call on the name of the Lord? That's what we're looking at here. And so as we look at this, is that what, what we're ha finding an example of? First of all, I want you to realize that, we, that it identifies what this parable was about. This parable is not about initial, the initial act of obedience unto salvation. The Bible tells us that this parable was to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. I want you to see that the point of the prayer, this, this tax collector's prayer, the whole point of his prayer was not to show us what to do to be saved. It was to show us his recognition of the need of forgiveness. The Pharisees didn't believe that they needed forgiveness. They believed that they could keep the law so well that they could make up for any transgression. But this tax collector understood that he could do nothing to make up for his sin. He could do nothing to earn it. And the point of the prayer is that recognition, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the point of the parable, not what a person must do in order to be saved. But I want you to notice, we also need to see that this tax collector is already in a covenant relationship with God. He was a Jew. You know the law. At eight days old, he was circumcised 
And he was brought into a covenant relationship with God as an infant. That's the way the law worked. The tax collectors were Jews, and they were hired to, to gather the taxes from the Jews uh, to give to Caesar. So here was a Jew, and this Pharisee's looking down on him because he's a tax collector, but he's a Jew. He was circumcised at eight days old. He's already in a covenant relationship with God. I want you to see that that's not the point of our question. No, the Bible deals with what a person who's a Christian already in a covenant relationship with God needs to do if they've sinned. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all, uh, uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No, there, there's, that's a whole nother subject. We're, we're asking the question this evening, what does a person do to call on the name of the Lord who's not a Christian, who is outside of Christ? But I want you to notice also that we don't even have the totality of this man's obedience recorded. You say, why we do? He cried out to God. He prayed to God. No, that's not all he did. And I'm going to tell you how I know that. Because according to the law in Leviticus chapter 4, in verse 27 through 28, if anyone sins and is guilty, he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats for his sin which he has committed. And in verse 35, it shall then be forgiven him. This man had to offer a sacrifice. Now that wasn't the point of the parable, so Jesus didn't go through all the steps of what this man had to do. The point of the parable was to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. So what's he showing us with this tax collector? His recognition of his unrighteousness. The fact that he didn't despise others, he despised his own sin and he under, understood his need for God. Jesus is not giving us a dissertation on how an alien sinner outside of a covenant relationship with God comes into a covenant relationship with God. And, and this, this wouldn't work anyway in order to do that because we don't have the totality. And then finally, we're not even under the same law. And this man was under the law of Moses, Colossians chapter 2, and in verse 14, Jesus has taken that law out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So looking at this as a case study of how a person is obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ would be like trying to determine a legal case here in America based upon Australian law. It, it, you can't do that. And so we learn from the Old Testament. We learn from, from the people under that law and even under the patriarchal dispensation. But we don't authorize what we do from that. This man was under a different law. So no, this is not an example of how we call on the name of the Lord. And so someone might say, well, okay, okay, maybe let, let's throw that one out, Brett. Maybe, maybe, we're going to, maybe Luke 18 and verse 13 doesn't do that. But I'll tell you what does. John chapter 1 and verse 12. That talks about receiving Jesus into your life as Lord and accepting him as your, as your personal Savior. All right, let's, let's read that. Let's actually start there in verse 11 and, and read with me there. In John chapter 1, in verse 11, it says, He came to his own. Now, that's telling us that Jesus came to the Jews first, his own people. And his own did not receive him. Notice that. This is an important key. His own did not receive him. Okay, now verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So notice that. He's telling us about those who received him. And you know, everybody says, well, Brett, that's what you've got to do to be saved. Just receive Jesus into your life as your personal Savior. All right, well, just notice here, it says that his own did receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave right. That's exosia, the Greek word for authority. He gave them the power, the authority, the right, the liberty to become children of God. What does it mean to receive him? That's the question, Right? You say, well, we just accept him into our heart as our personal Savior. I didn't read that in that verse. 
Let, let's, let's look at it and let's see, is that what it's saying? He says, as many as received him to them, he gave right to become children of God. Who are them that received him? I want to know that. He tells us in verse 13. He said, as many as received him, to them he gave right to become children of God. To those who, what? Believe in his name. He said, all right, yeah, I'm with you. That's right. That's what it means to receive him. Those who received him are those who believe in his name, right? Yes, amen. But that's not all. To those who believe in his name, to those, he says, who were born not of the flesh, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man but of God. So Jesus identifies, or the Holy Spirit, given this by Jesus, given to the apostles who wrote this down, and John writes that those who receive him are those who believe in his name and who are born of God. That's what it means to receive him. How do we do that? Well, I know what it means to believe in his name. I don't think that we've got to debate that. All of us understand. But to believe, put our trust in his name, his authority, his power, okay? What does it mean to be born of God? Because that is equal. I mean, both of these, they're tandem. They have to go together. That's how we receive him. Believe in his name and be born of God. What does it mean to be born of God? Well, to be born of God is brought out just a couple of chapters later. Just flip over to chapter 3. In John chapter 3, I want you to notice it with me. In John chapter 3, in verses 3 through 5. In verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now drop down to verse 5. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So what does it mean to be born again? It is to be born of God. Being born of God is to be born again. I don't think that we've got to argue that point. They are synonymous. If you're born again, you're born of God. And if you're born of God, you're born again. What does it mean to be born again? Well, Jesus tells us. It means to be born of water and of the Spirit. To be born of water and of the Spirit. Well, what is that? It's a good question. We need to answer that. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the Spirit, okay? He says to be born of water and the Spirit. We're going we're gonna to look at what it means to be born of the Spirit, and then we're going to come back and see what it means to be born of water. To be born of the Spirit, how, how, how does that happen? Well, I think that what most people would assume or, or maybe believe based on what they've been taught is, well, we're just born of the Spirit. It's just something the Spirit does. He, he just does it. You know, the Spirit's in us and He just does it. And I don't know how to explain it. I felt it. You know, is that what the Bible teaches? I, 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 I want to see what Scripture would teach that being born of the Spirit is, is just through some better felt than told experience. I, I would be happy to examine that passage, but I don't believe it's there. But you know, the Bible does speak about being born of the Spirit indirectly. Notice with me in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1 and in verse 18, I'm going to read first from the New King James Version. In James 1 and in verse 18, it says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. You see that phrase, brought us forth? That, that is a word in the Greek that means to give birth to. In the King James Version, it's worded this way. Of his own will begat he us. Well, I know what begattal is. Jesus was born of a woman. He was begotten of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And here it says that God begat us with the word of truth. Or he brought us forth. That, that means, according to Art and Gingrich, this Greek word means to be, to give birth to. God gave birth to us or brought us forth or begot us by the word of truth. Now back in John chapter 3, Jesus said that we must be born or brought forth, begotten of water and the spirit. 
And the same Holy Spirit here says that we were begotten or born or brought forth by the word of truth. That's got to be synonymous with either water or the spirit. Which one is it? Well, you know, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 says that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. It's the instrument by which the Holy Spirit operates and works. And here we are seeing the same thing that's attributed to the spirit being attributed to the word of God. And we understand from that that it is by means of the word of God that we are born again by the spirit. Let's notice another passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're just, seeing, we're, we're just taking the evidence here. We're, we're taking what the, what the word of God has to say. In 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 22, he says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, notice how obedience to the gospel or to the truth is connected with the Spirit. And remember when Derek read from Romans 10 in verse 12 through 16, it ended in verse 16 and said, But they have not all obeyed the gospel which corresponds with calling on the name of the Lord. Here in verse 22, he connects obeying the gospel or the truth, they're one and the same, being done through the Spirit, doesn't he? But then when you get to verse 23, he says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Born again through what? Water or spirit, he says, through the word of God. Once again, it is through the Spirit by means of the Word of God. But notice with me in Ephesians 6, 17, as I mentioned earlier, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is that instrument. But here's another interesting point. You remember in the parable of the sower in the book of Luke in chapter 8 and verse 11, when Jesus explained the parable of the sower where he sowed the seed, and that represented the seed being sown in men's hearts. What was the seed of the kingdom? Verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Let's go back to this metaphor that Jesus is using. Now this is a perfect metaphor because it's divinely used. It, it, he's the one that came up with it. He says that we're born again of water and of the spirit. You know, in every birth that I'm aware of, it takes two. Okay. Now, I'm even in the birth of Jesus, <laughs> it, it was Mary and it was God. Now, in, in our birth, it was a mother and it was a father. But there is a role in begattle, in birth, where the seed of life is planted. And then that life comes forth and then there's a new birth. But there is a seed. There is a seed of life. And in this case of being born of the Spirit, that seed, according to Jesus in Luke 8 and verse 11, is the Word of God. And that's why in James 1, 18, and in 1 Peter 22 and 23, he tells us we've been born again by means of the Word of God because that's the seed of life. But that seed of life is a seed of life because it's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, because it emanates from the Holy Spirit. So it is being born of the Spirit by means of that seed of life that is referred to as the Word of God. All of these passages showing us that we are born or begotten through the Word of God, it is that seed of spiritual life. What does it mean to be born of water? Turn over to Acts chapter 10. You can look high and low throughout the Scriptures, and I'm going to tell you that in the New Testament... When it comes to speaking about salvation, what people were doing in order to be converted to Jesus Christ, the only use of water that you're going to find is water baptism. Look with me in Acts chapter 10. He tells us in verse 47, in the household of Cornelius, Peter said, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Water baptism is Baptism in the name of the Lord, this proves it. And that baptism in the name of the Lord is the water of the new birth. Somebody says, oh, no, Brett, that, that water of the new, when he said you must be born of water and the spirit, he's talking about the fact that water is the physical birth and, and then the spirit is the spiritual birth. And the water, you know, when, when a baby's born, the water breaks and, and all of that. Well, first of all, that's, you know, that's not just water. <laughs> that, that's not 
that, that's a bodily fluid. Now, I know that we're made up primarily of water, but that's not, the Bible doesn't refer to bodily fluids as water. Not in that way. And furthermore, in order to be saved, you're saying that you must be born? In order to be saved, you must be born of water? You must have a physical birth? And that, that's going to have some serious ramifications when it comes to all of these poor little infants, these babies that have been murdered through abortion, other things like that. I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm not willing to buy that a, per, that a person's got to be born of water in that way in order to be in heaven with God. Now, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about another birth. You know, Nicodemus was asking, how can a man be born again? And when Jesus speaks about being born again, it is composed of water and the Spirit. If being born again, if, if, if the water is the physical birth, then the born again is merely the Spirit. But when Jesus refers to being born again, he brings them together. That's because he's talking about being born as a result of hearing the gospel, being convicted by it, that seed of life that convicts us and that teaches us what we need to do, that tells us about Jesus and how much he's loved us. And the fact that we are sinners, it makes us see ourselves as we are. That's the role that that seed of life plays. And it leads us to the waters of baptism in obedience because it directs us to the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead and it is in baptism that we'll be raised from the dead. That is the watery grave of baptism Water baptism in his name. And that shouldn't surprise us. You know, when we look over here in Romans chapter 6, in Romans chapter 6, you'll notice where uh, the Apostle Paul is speaking about that fact. As a matter of fact, and uh, uh, speaking about it as being newness of life. In Romans 6 and verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? newness of life. New life comes after baptism, according to Paul, according to the Holy Spirit. A newness of life. We rise up to walk. That's where the new birth is. That's where that being born again is culminated. We rise up to walk in newness of life. But notice also in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, this is a powerful text. In Galatians 3, beginning in verse 26, he says, for you are all sons of God. Now, hold on just a minute. Not everyone's the son of God. I mean, we're all sons of God in the sense of creation. But that's not what he's addressing here. He's talking about children of God through the new birth. He's writing to the brethren in the churches of Galatia. He says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a side point, but I, I, I believe that the better translation of this would be through faith in Christ, you are all sons of God. Now, you might say, well, what's the difference? I think there's a difference. It may not matter to you. But the bottom line is, he's telling, uh, he's telling them how they are sons of God through faith. Okay? How are they sons of God through faith? Look at verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see the word for? That's not the Greek word ace as it is in Acts 2.38. This is the Greek word gar. And the Greek word gar means because. You know, a lot of times our friends, when they see for in Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized, for the remission of sins, they'll say, oh, that word means because. No, it doesn't. That's the Greek word ace. It means into, unto, or toward. But this word translated for gar, it means because. So he says, you are sons of God, and that through faith. Through faith, you are sons of God because as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's powerful. Now listen, stay with me. I want you to try to chew on this a little bit. He says you are something because you were and thus you have. You are sons of God because you were baptized into Christ and thus have put on Christ. That's the point of the passage. Now, that being true, and it's true, I don't think anybody can argue with that. You, through faith, you are sons of God because 
You were baptized into Christ and thus have put on Christ. Now, if that's true, this is just a rule of language. If that's true, then it is just as true that you are not sons of God through faith because you were not baptized into Christ and thus have not put on Christ. You ever thought about that? If you are because you were, then you are not if you were not. <laughs> That's just a rule of language. I don't know if we got any English teachers here, but I'm pretty sure you can diagram that sentence and bring that out. That's powerful. There's no wiggle room. There's no way around that. Yes, we've got to be able to see and understand that he's telling us how we become children of God. I know how I became a child of Tom and Glenita Hoagland. I was born of Tom and Glenita Hoagland. And the way that I become a child of God is by being born of God, and I am born of God by water and the Spirit. And here he is talking about that very thing. But I want you to notice also, as we're looking at this idea then, of what it means to receive him. What we have seen is that those who receive him are those who believe in his name and who are born of God, which means to be baptized in the name of Christ based on faith that comes by hearing the word of God. Do you know that John chapter one in verses 12 through 13 teaches exactly the same thing as Mark Chapter 16 and verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's exactly what we just read in John 1, 12 and 13. Now, this is not teaching to accept Jesus in your heart as your personal Savior. And I don't have any problem with Jesus being our Savior. And of course, it's personal. <laughs> it's, it's very personal. But that's not what the Bible, that's not how the Bible puts it. The Bible tells us that we've got to be born of God in order to receive him. So this passage is not teaching that. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? It's not receiving him into our heart as our personal savior. It's not a, a, a crying out as the publican did. What does it really mean? I want you to look at an admonition in the, that the psalmist makes in the 145th Psalm. In the, the 145th Psalm, and in verse 18, the psalmist said, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. You know, that implies something. That implies that there's a false way to call on him. And that, that necessitates that we find out how do we call upon him in truth? What's the true way? Well, there must be a lot of false ways, but there's only one true way to call upon him. So how is that done? Let's look at the phrase that, that we read in Romans 10 and in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does that even mean? Well, the phrase call upon is a translation of one Greek word, epikaleo. And the word epikaleo means to call upon, to invoke, to call upon for oneself, on one's behalf, anyone as a helper. It means to appeal to one or make an appeal unto. I want you to notice this. Okay, Brett, I still think that calling on is a prayer, but you, you say it's an appeal to. Now, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's what the word means. It means to appeal to. And you might say, well, but I can appeal to God in a prayer. Agreed, agreed. But the word doesn't mean prayer. The word means to make an appeal to. Now that may not seem like it makes any difference to you, but stay with me, stay with me. It means to make an appeal to. And we see this in a number of passages. In Acts chapter 25 and in verse 11, you'll find the Apostle Paul as he is making an appeal based upon his uh, uh, arrest. And uh, he says in Acts 25 and verse 11, for if I'm an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Same word, epikaleo. And it's translated appeal there. Verse 12, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you shall go. Verse 21, Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus. In verse 25, the same as well. So this word means to make an appeal to. It means to invoke or appeal to God's authority because we're calling on what? The name of the Lord. That's not just a verbal, magical name. This is not an incantation. Say the right words and poof, you know, a rabbit comes out of the hat. 
Calling on the name of the Lord is appealing to His authority, His power to save us. And so we're appealing to God's authority to seek His blessings, namely, specifically in this case, the forgiveness of sins. But how do we appeal to God for forgiveness? I know we're taking it slow, but I want to make sure that you're staying with me. We're letting the Bible guide us down this path, right? Let's go to our text. In Romans chapter 10, we're going to see how we appeal to God for forgiveness by looking at a parallel of Scripture. Now, I want you to turn over to to Mark chapter 16, and and I want you to hold your place there because we're going to come to it in just a moment. Turn over to Mark 16 and and just put your ribbon marker or just a fat stubby finger right there and, and flip over and go to Romans chapter 10, and let's go back to our text, and let's start there. Now, Romans chapter 10 is interesting because it's kind of a, it's reasoning in reverse, okay? You remember Derek reading that as we began. And in Romans chapter 10, he says in verse 13, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then in verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, it's interesting the way that he puts this together. And I say he, I know Paul wrote this, but the Holy Spirit is the one that actually authored this. And he's reasoning it in reverse. But but here he talks about calling on the name in order to be saved. Well, if I want to know what it means to call on the name of the Lord, all I've got to do is, is to find a parallel passage that teaches the exact same thing, but maybe substitutes calling on the name of the Lord for some other synonymous word. That's in Mark 16. In Mark 16, beginning in verse 15, I want you to notice there. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He who believes and is baptized, shall be saved. You know, there is a rule of logic that two things equal to the same thing are equal to one another. That's reasonable, is it not? And here we have the exact same elements, the need for a preacher, the need for people to hear the gospel, the necessity that people believe in it, And then salvation. And I want you to know that word for word, iota for iota in the Greek, the phrase shall be saved in Romans 10 is identical to the phrase shall be saved in Mark 16 and verse 16. You know what the only difference is? In Romans 10, he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And in Mark 16, he says, baptize. Two things equal to the same thing, shall be saved, are equal to one another. I, I, we're just taking what the Bible has said on this. God doesn't contradict himself. And he's telling us this. That tells us that this is how we call on the name of the Lord. You, you might be saying, whoa, whoa wait, wait a minute. You said it was an appeal. Now you're saying it's baptism. Stay with me. Stay with me. I just want you to acknowledge that we, that deserves our attention. Are we going to find any other evidence for that? that baptism equates to calling on or appealing to the authority or the power of God. Well, let's consider it. Let's look in Paul's conversion. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. We go to Acts chapter 9. We're going to see an account of Paul's conversion. And we're going to learn a lot about that there. You know, in Acts chapter 9, we're going to see where Paul was on the road to Damascus And as he's on the road, he's going down to persecute Christians. And as he's on the road, he is blinded by a light from heaven. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then I want you to notice in verse 4, the Lord spoke directly to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then I want you to notice that he spoke directly to the Lord. In verse 5, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Verse 6, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Here is a man that believed. He asked, who are you? Jesus said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. And what did he call him? 
Lord. He knew then and there that the Jesus that he tried to destroy is in fact the Messiah, the Son of God. What do you want me to do, Lord? But not only that, I want you to see that he not only believed in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Lord, but he repented. You know, when we read what God said to Ananias, we realize that he had been three days there at the house of Simon, the tanner, and he had not eaten or drank anything for three days. You know, that kind of fasting was always an indication of tremendous sorrow, of godly sorrow. He was so sorrowful he couldn't eat or drink for three days. And you know what else is interesting about this? In verse 11, when, when Jesus speaks to Ananias, he said, inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he's praying. We've got a fellow here who has believed, he's repented, and he's praying. Now, I just want to challenge you. Go, go ask your preacher. Maybe if, if, you, if you, when I went through that track, you say, well, Brett, that's what I did. I, I prayed that prayer. I prayed that sinner's prayer. I accepted Jesus into my life as my personal Savior. Uh, all right, that's, that's, that's fine. I want, to, I want to challenge you. Go ask your preacher. Say, I've got a hypothetical. There's a guy that I know about that had an experience. He, he saw a vision. And he believed in Jesus as a result of that. The Lord spoke to him. He believed in Jesus and he repented of his sins and he prayed to God based upon that for three days. Was that person saved? I'm going to tell you, to every denominational preacher I know is going to say absolutely. You know what's interesting about this? Saul was not saved at that point. Because you remember he said to Jesus in verse 6, Lord, what do you want me to do? What did Jesus say to him? He said, go into the city and it will be told you there what you must do. That means he hadn't done it yet. And until Ananias came to him, he hadn't been told what he must do. He had believed, he had repented, and he had prayed, but he still hadn't done what he must do, had he? Because he hadn't been told. Ananias came to him. and What was it that Ananias told him? Ananias in Acts 6, 22 and verse 16 said to him, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Look at it. Calling on the name of the Lord. The Holy Spirit connects calling on the name of the Lord with baptism. It is an appeal. And you might be saying, I don't see an appeal to me is, is to speak, to pray in some way. I understand that. Sometimes that's what we have in our mind. That's all we can see. You know, it's like seeing that picture. Is it a young woman or, or an old lady? <laughs> and once you see it one way, you can't see it the other way. I'm just telling you, this is what the Bible says. That baptism is calling on the name of the Lord. But you know, I think it's made clear again in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, I want you to notice there where the scripture tells us on the day of Pentecost... The Bible tells us that Peter is telling those people that what they're seeing is what was prophesied by Joel the prophet. And he says to them that this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And in verse 21, Joel prophesied that whoever called on the name of the Lord would be saved. And Peter said, this is the fulfillment of that. Verse 21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. Peter said, what you're seeing right now is the fulfillment of that promise. Well, how did they do it? Well, and Peter then, as a result of that, began to preach to them who the Lord was. He said, I got to tell you some bad news. The Lord that you need to call on, you murdered him. With lawless hands, you hung him on a tree and killed him. But the good news is God raised him from the dead. All those prophecies, those weren't about David. Those were about his seed. It was about his, his descendant. It's about Jesus who was raised from the dead and we're his witnesses. And so in verse 37, those people were convicted. They were cut to the heart that they had murdered the Lord that they must call upon in order to be saved. And they had a question for Peter and the rest of the apostles. They said, men, brethren, what shall we do? I want to ask you something. What were they, what, what was that question about? Were they asking, what shall we do in order 
to graduate from college? Were they saying, what shall I do to get a, to get a, a scholarship for four years? What shall I do to, to become a fireman? What, what were they asking? Because people tell me all the time that Peter's answer in verse 38 was telling them what to do because they were already saved. Is that what they were asking? Peter told them that Joel prophesied that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They hadn't done it. And you're telling me that they asked Peter, oh, well, what do we do since we're already saved? They were cut to the heart because they weren't saved. They asked him what to do in order to be saved. And Peter answered that question. And I want you to notice what Peter didn't say. Look at verse 38. Peter did not tell them to accept Jesus into their heart as their personal Savior. He did not tell them to pray for salvation. You'll never see someone told to do that in the New Testament. What did Peter say? Peter told them to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And again, he told them that this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. They ask him in verse 37, how do we call on the name of the Lord? That's what their question was. And in verse 38, he told them how. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. One last passage. In 1 Peter 3 and in verse 21. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 21, I want you to notice with me there, New King James says, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to realize that the word translated answer in the New King James and in the King James, it is an accurate translation for people who lived in the 1600s and spoke English. <laughs> uh, it's unfortunate for us because while it is accurate according to the time in which the King James was translated, because the way that they used the word answer actually meant a defense. It, it was something that they would do in a court of law, or it was an appeal. You know, the Greek word here is aperotima. And the word aperotima, according to Vine, he says, it is not, as in the King James Version, an answer. It was used by the Greeks in a legal sense as a demand or an appeal. Baptism is the appeal is therefore the ground of an appeal by a good conscience against wrongdoing. Interesting. Vine says this word means an appeal. And again, I want to defend the King James, New King James. That's what the word answer meant in the English language when it was translated. But today, that's not the way we use the word. Fortunately, in the New American Standard Bible, it says that baptism is not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. The ESV says that it is not the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Th this translation makes more sense in our vernacular today. What I want you to realize, though, that baptism is an appeal. It is an appeal. It is appealing, calling toward the authority of God for the forgiveness of sins. I know you're, you're thinking... Now, I, I, intellectually, Brett, I see it, but I just can't wrap my mind around baptism being an appeal because I still think of it as being verbal. Let me, let me give you an illustration. Here, here's one of those anecdotes that I spoke about the other day. I'll never forget, as a young boy, and I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I was probably in that six, seven-year-old range. And it was Sunday evening, and we lived way out in the country, so it was a long drive into Oklahoma City to go to church. And when church was over, my dad, one of the elders there, he would greet folks and visit. But when it was time to go, he would head toward the car. And since we had a long drive, the kids better scurry out there. So we had to keep him in the corner of our eye all the time. He didn't want to have to round us up. He didn't want to have to say anything. Well, as soon as services were over, the preacher's son, you know how preacher's kids are. He was an ornery kid and he was older than me. And he came up to me and he said, hey, I found something really neat I want to show you, but don't let anyone see it. And I said, okay. And he took me to that room around behind the baptistry where they prepare the Lord's Supper. And he shut the door and looked around and he pulled that tray down off the shelf. And there was that bread that everybody ate every Sunday and I never got to 
I'd always wanted a bite of that bread. Well, we had actually kind of gone on a little scavenger hunt. We had gone through classrooms and looked at a lot of things, but that was really the end of it. And I didn't realize how long it had been, but we had been back there for a long time exploring. Well, my dad had already gone out to the car and waited for a while, long enough to be pretty angry. He came back in, he looked in every classroom, he looked in the bathroom. He finally looked in the room where I was, right about the time that I was taking a bite of that bread and the crumbs were falling down my chin. He grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and led me out to the car and in that low voice said, when we get home, I'm gonna wear you out. I was, you know, that little shiver you get when your dad says that to you and you know he means it. I got in the car and we had that 30 minute drive, 40, 40 minute drive home. And I appealed to him for forgiveness all the way home. And you know what? I didn't say a word. I sat in the back seat next to my little annoying sister and I smiled at her. I was sweet to her. I gave her everything she wanted. I talked to my mom about how church was, and I just made conversation. I jumped out and opened my mom's door, and I was doing everything I could because with my dad, you didn't appeal to him by talking. You got in deeper. You appealed to him through humility, through contrition, and through obedience. That's how you made it to his heart. There is a way that we appeal through obedience. I know you're wondering, well, did he whip you? Of course he did. He said he would. <laughs> I, I didn't touch anything in him. But that is the only way, if I was going to do it, that I could have done it. And, what, and my point is this, that that's not that foreign to, to us as children. That, that's how you make an appeal. Now, I know I, I, my oldest child was a lawyer as a little kid. I mean, he debated everything, you know, and it worked against him. But, but my point is that the, the successful way to appeal is through humble contrition and obedience. And that's exactly what God is saying. And, and think about this. What is baptism? Colossians chapter 2 says in verse 12 that it is a burial through faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. It is an act that manifests my faith that God raised Jesus from the dead because I'm being buried in water and raised up to show God I believe that he raised Jesus. Yes, that's how we appeal to God. The bottom line is, my friend, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> that's how we call on the name of the Lord. And so this is important. You know, when we think about this calling on the name of the Lord, there are some applications then. If you prayed the sinner's prayer in order to be saved, or if you accepted Jesus into your heart in order to be saved, if you believed that you were saved after believing and praying, of which there is not one scripture to teach any of these things, then you were not calling on the name of the Lord for forgiveness when you were baptized. You weren't. You, you, you couldn't have been. You know, the 145th Psalm said in verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. And the Bible says that we call upon him in baptism. And you say, oh, well, well, I was baptized, Brett. It's, it's okay. We're all good. Yeah, I, I, I prayed to God for salvation, but, but I was baptized later, so it's all good. It's not all good. Because when you were baptized, you weren't calling on the name of the Lord for salvation. You believed you were saved at the point of faith and when you prayed that prayer. As a matter of fact, you were calling on men to see an outward sign of an inward grace. I know you've heard that. That's what every denominational preacher says that baptism is. It's not for salvation. It is an outward sign of something that's already been done inwardly. So what is it? An outward sign. An outward sign means you're calling on others. You're showing men what God has already done in you. That's not calling on the name of the Lord. And that's according to the doctrines of men. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. So friend, I, I want to tell you, just as, as kindly as I can, if you prayed the sinner's prayer to be saved, accepted Jesus into your heart, believed that you were saved after believing and praying, then you did not have faith in the working of God to raise you from spiritual death and baptism when you were baptized. You believed you were already saved. 
And that means that right now, you haven't called on the name of the Lord. And what you need to do is to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins and for the first time in your life, call on the name of the Lord through that obedience. It's not hard to understand. I know you can see it. I don't know if you're willing to accept it. That's between you and God. But I'm pleading with you. You see what the Bible says. You see what you need to do. Are you willing? We're going to sing a song that it, in hopes that, 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 that it might touch your heart as well. But whatever you need to do to be right with God, we extend that invitation to you. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, come believing in him, confessing your faith in him, repenting of your sins, and be baptized in water, calling on the name of the Lord. And let's do that tonight as we stand and sing the invitation song.